There's a whole load of myths which you question in various ways. There's a whole load of kind of realities and grittiness that you're all experiencing, both from kind of the infrastructure provider perspective of Kickstarter, but also from the kind of nitty gritty end of both of you and your banking practices and the engagement practices. But it feels like the maturity of some of these things that we're trying to leverage isn't equal. So although we're saying that there are things that are possible now that weren't possible then, I don't think it's that we can necessarily get an equal amount of eyeballs on a thing as well as an equal amount of making a production of a thing. I don't feel like the infrastructures associated with attention, production, and distribution are actually equal. At this point, I feel like particularly the distribution one, it's not there yet. I don't think there's the logistics behind getting products to people. Really low friction to a tiny amount of attention. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So I don't know if that's, does that sound rational? Is that much of your experience? Or am I bullshitting? So just call it if I am. <laughs> I, I don't think you're, uh, you're bullshitting. I think there's, it's, it's interesting because it's, yeah, like Kickstarter makes it nice and easy. I mean, there's still a lot of work involved in getting the word out, but it means you can kind of like find the market and get them to commit to some stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of depends what you're trying to make on some of those stuff. So it feels like making a circuit board with components on, to me at least, that's quite understood. Yeah. And there are loads of places that will do PCB manufacturing, PCB assembly, but then once you want to kind of like do more stuff around that, it's like really difficult to work out what the scale is that you know, you're like I can, I can spin up getting a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand PCBs made, like almost to the point where I can just upload a file to the internet and put it together and pay some money. But can you get um, back into ten thousand people's hands? And that's yeah, the distribution you, doesn't feel like is there. The also just manufacturing of other things, like how do you do plastics? At that you know, you can do injection molding at high scale. You can do laser cutting at a very small scale. Like, you can't really scale those in the middle. Um, similarly, like, um, I don't know, yeah, wood and things. Yeah, it's like, it feels like that's kind of a reasonably well-defined problem that people can go, oh yeah, upload some files and do some things. And then other stuff, it's just like, oh yeah, that's complicated. You need to go and talk to people now. Is it building a package to actually get it out to the market? Build the components in different areas, but building the package to actually supply to the consumers. Yeah, I think it's worth describing also how you make things, I guess. Maybe there are some little bits of it we've well, worked out. That goes back to your other point, though, about that middle section of industry that's not valorized and isn't necessarily visible or valued. And it's all of those knowledges associated with people on industrial states making things that, to an extent, we, as the maker movement, have kind of come in and gone, look, you can make things, it's amazing. <laughs> um, in doing that, shifted the attention again away from the people who, are, who have that essential knowledge in the middle, that who we need to be able to join the dots between doing something at scale and doing something at a kind of micro and individual level. I mean, that intention leverage, I think, is really interesting because Kickstarter's gone from that point of kind of going, look, here's a shiny thing, it'd be so cool, wouldn't you like one? To being able to now genuinely develop communities. So I don't know if you want to talk about how Yeah, I mean, that I think that's like, when I talked about this, like, 2009 moment for when Kickstarter was first started and that, like, almost utopian, like, oh, it's the internet, you can put something, you're going to be making something and put something on the internet and everybody's going to fund it. And, you know, we know that that's not... True. I mean, you know, there's just, it's so, um, the internet is a very crowded space, and especially so now where, like, you know, it's not like you, you know, everything runs through Facebook, Facebook's locked down, if you want to get, you know, strangers' eyeballs on your thing, it's going to be, you're going to pay for it through, like, paid advertising and these things. So, so, you know, people often ask me, like, how Kickstarter has changed over time. I don't think that the mechanism has changed very much, but the internet around it has changed a lot. And so, yeah, I don't, like... I'm not trying to put forth this narrative that it's just like put something on the internet and the internet money fairies are going to come along and fund things. I think you know that yeah, the attention is the key, like 
inequality, I think, in, in terms of how you can get out there and, and get your idea kind of in the world. Um, yeah. It's, Yes, yeah, and we now yeah. understand the internet as an ecosystem rather than the yeah. internet as the kind of free for all utopian. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have done so much. Yep. Yeah. But you're also kind of still bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. Kind of like ends me. Yeah. I think that's how do we do that bit better? How do we do the actually being able to make a living at the same time and not paying through blood and sweat and tears? Um. Well, we could try and be a bit better at sales. Well, I do think I'm not personal. Oh, sorry. Um, but yes. <laughs> um, on a strategic level, how can we pay ourselves? Well, I don't know. I think, you know, back in the olden days, it took businesses a while to become profitable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was relatively normal. And, you know, if you were able to attract some external investment, all power to you, you know. But you know, that sort of bizarre little industry that's happened now around sort of VC tech investment, and you've got to scale and all that shit, so I just, sort of, <laughs> you know, that's not really enjoyable. And yeah, so it's, that's kind of there's a huge the failure thing. rate and, you know, I'm I'm quite comfy. Like I really liked the design entrepreneurship. Like, oh, that's me, you know. <laughs> um, you know, because a designer's natural approach is to try things and react and develop instead of, you know, just turning everything up to eleven. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably a little bit like sort of pre-tech VC crazy. You know, that's sort of the way that you would make an idea come out, and yeah. it takes time. And uh, you know that probably needs to be okay again. And I think, yeah. you know, a lot of the sort of VC tech explosion has been around web-based software as well, which is notoriously easy to deploy and notoriously easy to change and, you know, iterate upon. But um, I think in this zone, it's just not, you know. Um, so maybe something in there. Well, also, also that kind of digital business model applied to a physical world is something that we trip over quite a lot. So we have we probably all know the horror stories around that, where people kind of, with the bike sharing, where you end up flooding the streets with bikes with a digital model that yeah. doesn't necessarily scale to the kind of nitty gritty of the real world. Yeah. And I guess the other thing in this space is the consequences of things. So actually understanding and having a grasp if you are designing or making or scaling something as to how big 10,000 is, how many boxes is that? Like, how much mess is that? How much waste? How much consequence? How many people's lives are we actually shaping when we scale and when we make things properly? Yeah. Not only in the world, but also for yourself. Like, you know, I do a lot of work with students, and, and uh, yeah, if they, you know, they have a thesis project. Like, you know, I work with a lot of the RCA students. It's like, okay, we have a thesis project. You can put that on Kickstarter and probably raise, you know, you get, you get like, 400 backers or 500 backers is such a cool idea, but do you, is that what you want to be doing for the next like three years, five years of your life? Because it's going to take a lot of effort to do that, and so you really have to just yeah, decide what you like, how you want to spend your time. Do you want to have a massive project that takes over your entire life? Um, so yeah, not only thinking about what, how how much do we want to put into the world, what is the scale of what we want to put into the world, but also what is the scale of the things that we want to take on ourselves. And yeah, what we all want to do with our lives. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, well, you don't want to be a product manager. You don't necessarily want to be manufacturing things. Yeah. Um, so is that a new job role there, or is that an old <laughs> job role there? <laughs> well, I mean, if I was in a different room, I'd probably say that Museum in a Box is a content business, <laughs> you know, or a, a content supporting platform. And you know, that's why I'm kind of interested in, the, in just the prompt that maybe the box itself is a bit of a um, uh, weight, well not a weight, but you know, a, um, you know what I mean, a yeah, gravitational a force. Huh? A red herring maybe. Well, we talk about yeah. um, ideation fixation, so one of the things we try and get our students to do a lot is have parallel prototypes of multiple ideas at any given time, just to stop them banding too soon yeah. and fixating, and then we're not making that thing better. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's the hardest thing about the business is that, you know, and it's not to say it's impossible, and people really do enjoy it, so I just, you know, want to respond to that, and the tactility of the thing is really important to it, you know, blah, 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 but 
if I could just bypass having to actually manufacture them all and get the children to do it, you know, yeah. I think that would be a really big win. So, yeah, you know. Yeah. And then we're back to kind of makers as an industry in and of themselves that we're either enabling other industries to parasite up or we're enabling different ways to distribute on the assumption that there is a maker and on the assumption that people want to make things themselves. Or you're running the uh, <coughs> build a bear retail chain yeah. uh, for making boxes instead of <laughs> Instead of bears. Maybe we should make it like a bear. <laughs> but you know, there is also more and more people in the world each day who know how to 3D print something or who know how to, you know, make the Raspberry Pi say hello or whatever. So it's, you know, this is also intended to sort of enhance that type of learning for people in a school. You know, so it's, there is strategy, believe it or not. And, yeah, definitely. you know, the strategy is. Hopefully not to ever manufacture anything. Because <laughs> I think that whole thing sucks as well. You know, why do you have to make hundred thousand things for ten cents? You know, yeah. I don't like that. I'm really conscious that this is an expert audience in this room. Yeah. And I would really like your questions, your points, your trolling of our panel. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> keep worrying about making this short run of like hundred things, but uh, that will sort of require a bit of a production line. I mean. Imagine if you actually organised a well-organised production line, you'd find a few volunteers for doing that. I haven't seen this happen. We did have Abdul last week who was trying to do his own production line of cardboard boxes on his own, filling out most of the space, but just getting a set of three or four people. I think Patrick used to do this as well, but by himself with some of his circuit board stuff. But uh, I, I haven't seen any of that kind of activity yet. We, we have done some of it with Museum in Box, but it's happened in London. Right. Rather than here, like Julian's always badgering me because he wants to, he wants to help make things and be in a part of the production line. Oh, um, yeah, great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when you're doing things on your own. Yeah, we, we, and so we do do those. So like, uh, we had the approach of a production line when we were making a ridiculous number of um, Christmas lights for Williamson Square last yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Um, uh, no, it just kept going wrong. Though, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there was just a lot of it to do. Uh, I'd like to do more of that too, though. Yeah. Like we yeah. we sort of we call the like we used to call the box the brain. So we had these events called brain raisings. You know, where you buy a bunch of cake and you just said, people come and you know, you have a very simple job. Can you please glue this acrylic box together, or yeah. can you please just solder this, this, and this? You know, and yeah, I'd love to do that. Table and yeah, 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 yeah. This room looks pretty good for that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Well, venture. <laughs> no, no, I mean, but there are if it could be used to sort of teach people things or, you know, I don't know, maybe you get a box at the end. I don't know. I think that'd be You could cool. just pay them. Yeah, I like that. Let's do that. I don't know. No, no, exploitation is not my natural, you know, desire here. You could just pay them. Yeah. yeah but did. I don't have enough cash, right? Today. Question? Yeah, it's a question of the kind, I suppose. I'm loving hearing about the missing middle. Resonates with me that we don't hear enough at all about that middle ground. And yet, my understanding is that SMEs are the engines of the economy. You know? mm -hmm. That's where the benefits and the growth come from. So, why are they missing? You know? And also, they have connections to the local community and to the workforce and all these great things that benefit everybody. But I was listening to what you were saying about avoiding the manufacturing, and it made me think that you know, we have this little company called ARM, and they did quite well at avoiding manufacturing. I let the other people. Keith, 
Um, but I don't know, maybe yeah, I'm sure Keith can tell us whether they do or not. But <laughs> mostly they don't tell you about the people in the middle. Awesome. Who are the interesting ones? Yeah, I already know the Jaguar Land Rover down the road. Like, I don't, you know, that doesn't give me anything new. Like, finding out there's some people, you know, like when, I, when we moved here and I discovered that the women, like, the number of people who now know in Liverpool that most of the UK is women, <laughs> please have it to made just over the road. Because that's my go to story for like, there's tribal really, they're great, we're going to go have a tour around the factory, it's going to be awesome. Um, I think the biggest problem in the middle bit for me is that all those SMEs do exist in isolation or they work for the big boys or they do their own things. But those relationships come from those from the big players. Why would an average Joe know about those people? And because you're not, unless you've been part of a big organisation, you wouldn't know who's qualified. I think it's more of visibility of what is in a local environment. That's really hard from an average Joe walking around and coming to a place like this or make space. Unless you know someone, it's that visibility of almost, everyone forgets almost all of the UK is an SME. And we forget, in Richard Estates, Heartlands run the UK. And unless you're in that, you don't see it. And I think that's the <laughs> big area of how people can make short runs, make a living, and not have to go to China. Um, is it is, is a potential visibility in how you access that? Because how would an average show approach an SME? So, so. But also recognising why it's invisible anyway. Because yeah. that's kind of part of the long history of the SMEs and some of the. Mm. Um, consequences of how SMEs and manufacturing was <coughs> profiled or supported or not in yeah. the 80s is it's sometimes useful yeah. to be invisible. We've got two questions here, and then I'm literally going to make you come and be on the panel anyway. <laughs> so, I uh, wanted to ask um, a fourth question, which is to kick start about it. I love how you sort of dived into the um, Liverpool, mm -hmm. you know, how many examples you could have unearthed yeah. based on one city. Yeah. Um, I'm based at Leeds and I'd love to kind of look at how you could drill down into that sort of data and say what kinds of manifestations are there yeah. from a city by city, yeah. whether that's making a product, product or actually how do cities articulate their cultural output in some ways. Yeah. Have you ever done anything along those lines? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, yeah, I am looking at cities all the time and like what are the most, and I have the, because I live here, I have this sense that Liverpool is like, so many amazing examples and so many projects for our size. I think I looked at the data and like Bristol is actually better in, in terms of like the more per capita or like, uh, well, Birmingham or something like this. So, but it does feel like that there's a certain energy around, yeah, projects. And when I, I say better, I mean like for Kickstarter, as in projects launching on Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not better, but it's I guess. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I'm always looking at that and then trying to see. But I, but I think it is like a sort of network effect. Like you see, like for example, Kitty's Laundrette, uh, you know, Grace launched that because she saw a Grammy workshop. Grammy workshop saw that because they saw a uh, home big Anfield. And so there's a sort of network effect that happens when, when there is success, it starts to like, you know, beget success. And also those people become uh, advice for the, for other, you know, campaigns. So it's not just that they see the success stories, they also will advise them. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Keith has answered a lot of questions about Kickstarter and like how to run a Kickstarter project because he had a 200,000 pounds, you know, Kickstarter project, uh, you know, which was very successful. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing. I love looking at cities and, and their cultures and, um, yeah. and so could you surface that if, if like a city or I came to you and said, can you help us understand more about what our cities are up to? Yeah. We have. Yeah, we could. I mean, we could the data. I, I suppose it would take somebody to do something interesting with that data, or like a researcher to like actually make sense of that data. Because I can tell you how many projects have launched per capita, but I don't. Again, I sort of don't know really what that exactly means. So I would love to work with yeah researchers, perhaps in cities, to say like, here's the data on things that are coming to Kickstarter. That's one indication of maybe some kind of entrepreneurial activity. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 I'm going to be. Sorry. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've just changed what I'm going to talk about, so I'm just going to be. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You guys have been brilliant. Um, Thank you. Big round of applause.